I think operating as a professional, one of the best things you can do for yourself is making sure that you're getting enough feedback on your practice. I mean, it's a big thing that you can do for your learners, but it's also just a big thing that you can do for your own purposes. How are you finding out about the efficacy of what you're doing? And, you know, honestly, like I said, you can just go follow people around. You can go just talk to them, you know, a little bit afterwards. You can uh, watch them use stuff that you build. There's a whole slew of of quick quick methods for that that I think um, people aren't making enough use of and as a result we're all a little starved for feedback on, on on what we're doing and you know it can be a little uncomfortable but ultimately it's a really great thing. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are and wherever you're watching from. I'm Matt Pierce, the host of the Visual Lounge where we talk about images and video for the workplace. Today, we are gonna be talking about something that I think is super exciting because I'm an instructional design nerd. We're gonna be talking about designing for how people learn with the one and only Julie Dirksen. And I'm so excited to have her here. Uh, if you don't know Julie's work, go find her book, go find her website, go find all of her stuff because she has so much great information. And if you happen to be at a conference, go to one of her sessions. I can guarantee you will, you'll be blown away by the things that you learn. And so even if you're not an instructional designer, don't, don't, don't freak out and say, hey, this isn't for me, because we all have things that we can help people learn and we can do that in a better way. So with that said, let me go ahead and officially introduce Julie. Julie Dirksen is the author of the book, Design for How People Learn, and a learning strategy consultant with a focus on incorporating behavioral science into learning interventions. She has experience creating digital learning experiences for diverse clients, ranging from Fortune 500 companies, international NGOs, technology startups, and grant-funded research initiatives. She loves brains and games and evidence-based practice. Her MS degree is in Instructional System Technology from Indiana U University, and she's been an adjunct faculty member at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and is a Learning Guild Guildmaster. She's happiest whenever she gets to learn something new. And with that all said, you think I'd be able to say it easier by now. Welcome, Julie, to the Visual Lounge. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I figured I should not struggle on Indiana University being an alumni <laughs> myself, but it's the one thing that I tripped up on. Well, Julie, it, it is truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, in the circles that I, I kind of work and breathe in, you are uh, a rock star by the highest means. So it's really a privilege to, to have you with us today. All right. Well, thank you. So, Julie, we're going to start with our, our first three questions that we're asking everyone. And, and the first one is, you know, how did you get involved with instructional design and, and learning stuff? Uh, I, I feel like I have the most common origin story, which is you, you, you do a decent job of uh, a particular job and then they want you to train other people. Um, I feel like a lot of people come at it from, hey, you have some design knowledge. Guess what? We're going to let you train everybody else now. Um, and then you kind of have to backfill on the learning design and how to be an effective facilitator and all of those kinds of things. So I started out, um, my initial kind of foray into education stuff was actually doing a certificate program and teaching English as a foreign language, which I did a little bit. Um, but then I was working for um, a finance company uh, just as a part-time job. And they said, hey, do you want a full-time job training uh, other people? And I said, sure, let's try that. And, um, uh, and I found that that actually doing the training, I like it, but I like a limited amount of it. Like I don't like doing it every day, all day, because the people who can do that, who are classroom facilitators, you know, basically 40 hours a week, hats off to them. That is, that's so much yeah. energy going out, you know? Um, and, uh, and what I really found interesting was dealing with both the technology piece and also how do you learn to design interesting learning experiences. Um, and also I was working with like a customer service group and I got really interested in the question of when is it the right answer to fix the people versus when is it the right answer to try to build a better system for them to use to do their mm -hmm. jobs, which got me interested in things like uh, usability and human computer interaction. We weren't even calling it user experience yet. Um, that's, how, that's how long I've been doing this stuff. Um, but really what eventually became UX. So I wound up being interested in both those fields, which was how I wound up at Indiana is because they had um, you know, a really good uh, instructional uh, technology group, but they also had um, curriculum and interesting people in things like interface design and human computer interaction and information systems and all of those kinds of things. And so that's um, uh, that 
that wound up being kind of a lifelong interest in um, how those things overlapped and how we should be using user experience and some of those kinds of things in learning design. Yeah, and I, and having been through the that similar program, but after you, it yeah, I love the the meshing and thinking about the systems. It's something that still I find myself, you know, it's not about the always about the instruction, although instruction is good. It's about how what are all the other pieces that come into play. So I I, I love that. So let this is probably maybe a little bit based on what you just said, maybe even too narrow of a question, but I'll ask it anyways. Um, generally, because I know there's cir circumstantially, there's going to be different answers behind on circumstances, people, things like this, but d how do you define success in terms of learning design? How do you kind of look at that and say like, yeah, this is generally successful? Yeah. And that's an interesting one because there's a, there's a number of different levels you can look at. And, um, uh, so you, you know, like something could be successful if it runs well, right? Like, you know, whether it's a, a workshop, a live classroom workshop or an e-learning program or something like it's runs well, it's a good experience for people and things like that. Um, you know, and that's kind of the, the most basic level, right? You want things that run well, you want things that operate smoothly, that you want things that people have a positive opinion about. But of course, that doesn't really tell us if it's effective mm -hmm. at, you know, kind of higher order levels, right? Um, you know, people can have an amazing experience and still not retain very much from it. Um, people can have an amazing experience and even retain some of the knowledge from it, but they don't actually enact that knowledge when they go back to the workplace and some of those kinds of things. So a lot of a, a lot of this is really kind of the the thinking about what's the whole system that's going to support something and how are you gonna how are you gonna measure it? Um, measurement is hard. I mean, we all struggle with this one, right? Uh, the the things that I've kind of been talking about in that space lately is like, I feel like the Kirkpatrick's and everybody does a good job of explaining all those levels of evaluation. And I don't, I don't spend too much time there, but, um, but I know that like actual behavioral evaluation feels overwhelming to people sometimes. And so one of the things I've been looking at is what are some little things in that people can do if they don't have access, you know, it's difficult to collect a date, a lot of data if your organization doesn't already collect a lot of data, right? Like from L and D, you don't usually have the leverage in the organization to get a bunch of people to collect data that they're not collecting right now. Um, Kathy Moore always asks, you know, what thing, if this training works, what thing that you're already measuring will change? And if they say they're not already measuring a thing, then obviously that's its own conversation to have. Um, but um, but I've been looking at things like, you know, can we do um, cohort analysis. So we can't afford to gather data from the entire population, but can we get a small subset that we actually do the follow-up, you know, the real measurement with, or can we, um, uh, can we uh, do even just follow-up interviews like six weeks later, tell me what stood out to you from the training, what have you used, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, Brinkerhoff success case model is, is a possibility for that that has some that has some basis and some structure to it and things like that. So the question is, how are you getting feedback as a practitioner? Because one of the challenges I think we all have in this field is often we're really starved for enough feedback on our efforts and what's working and what's not working and um, you know where where it's going from here. And I I I struggle with this too. I feel like I'm I'm frequently not getting <laughs> enough enough of a feedback loop on stuff. Yeah. Um, you do the best you can with it, but um, but yeah, it's a real challenge. Yeah, but I, I think that's a, a great broad view, right? Like you laid out several things already, like, okay, you could look at data that you've getting, you're getting all these pieces that ideally you'll be able to find something or at least understand kind of what you're going to impact. So I, I do like that. And I, you're right. We all struggle with it. Even, even I think some places where we have good kind of metrics in place, it's still, it's still hard because as it does it really tell us what we want to know? And ultimately, mm -hmm. for me, a lot of times it's like, can they do the thing? Can, has it changed the behavior? Is it, have they built the habit to continue doing something? And those, those are all hard, right? And it's going to yeah. probably remain to be hard. But I do appreciate and that you're just rattling off these, these things that are in your head too, Kathy Moore. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, it's, it's awesome. Okay, so yeah. this one's, uh, this one's going to take us a little bit uh, askew because I know you you are not necessarily an expert in image and video, but it's yeah. one that we like to ask people. And I, you know, as I was going through your book, I do appreciate all the the graphics that are in there, the visualizations that you use. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, particularly from a learning perspective, using whether it's video or images, 
what's one tip you would, you would give to people about making those better or more effective from a learning perspective? Yeah. You know, one of the things, there's a, um, there's a researcher, Benjamin Bergen, who looks at language processing um, and does, you know, like actual studies in the brain around language processing and some of those kinds of things. And he talks about the importance of being able to picture something in your head while people are talking about it. Um, and he makes, draws the connection between that and like a lot of the visual metaphors that we just use in language. So if I talk about breaking the glass ceiling, like that creates kind of a physical space idea that you can use to understand what that language means. And obviously nobody has actually gone and like pounded on an actual glass ceiling within a hammer, you know, like this is not a literal thing, but having some kind of concrete thing. And we look at this for storytelling or we look at this for analogies or metaphors, but having something that you can like also picture, um, whether you're giving them a literal picture, you're giving them a visual image or you're even just drawing like kind of a word picture for people to, associate with their heads, turns out that there's probably some benefit in terms of being able to process language. So whenever we deprive people of that, um, uh, you know, and like I said, it can be a literal picture. It can be like, here's an image that allows you to organize this as I'm talking about it. Um, you know, those kinds of things. So whenever we're dealing, especially with abstract concepts or abstract ideas, um, visuals become an important part of making sense of, you know, complicated words or abstract ideas or any of those kinds of any of those kinds of things. Yeah. So it gives you something to, to the, the learner or the viewer to wrap around and understand whereas maybe, you know, there's probably lots of concepts, particularly we could talk instructional design, lots of concepts. It's like, I, I don't get it. And then you mm -hmm. see some visual, it, Oh, okay. Start to make sense. And you can build off of maybe kind of commonality, I suppose. Yeah, and I mean, we it, we evolved to have a very complex set of memory for physical spaces um, and a much less, less sense of memory for like abstract information. You know, like for most of our evolutionary history, we didn't really deal with, you know, um, numbers bigger than like a half a dozen or, you know, things like right. that. And so, because um, you need a recording system in order to even be able to kind of like think about and process that kind of stuff. Um, and so pre-literate stuff, you're just not... Uh, you're not dealing with it. And so like you get things like memory palaces, which are this idea of how people really extend our capacity for memory. And this is the trick that um, people who like do memory competitions use. So they can memorize the order of a, pa a pack of playing cards by having a visual map in their brain of a physical space. And then they drop the cards mentally through the spaces and try to create something vivid and visual that they associate with it. So we know that like having a strong visual association with something can be incredibly important for memory and retention. And we have all of this capacity in our visual memory system that can, if we're clever about it, can be used to um, remember all sorts of non-visual non -visual information. Yeah, my memory palace is pretty small at this point, but I, I, I work on it. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, I mean, so the idea that you have this, and I, I actually should do one sometime because I don't think I ever have, but you know, like, like create a path through your childhood home mm -hmm. and think of, you know, stations like 30 stations in your childhood home. And then you can drop things in those and you, you know, cause typically we don't remember beyond seven ish. I mean, it's, it's not an exact number, but usually like, you know, when you go above like seven digits or something like that, people are unlikely to remember it. And the people who can remember these things, have strategies. There's somebody who could memorize like 40 digits, but he remembered them as um, race times because he was also a runner, uh, you know, right. so kind of creating some kind of concrete association with abstract information and visuals. Sorry, I'm going way nerdy on this. But. No, this is, this is, this is so fast. It's so fascinating because yeah. I think, you know, there's so many applications when, you know, and, and there's definitely other things we want to talk about, but I, I love this because I think from a kind of a, current modern day looking at the world we are inundated with many more visuals than i think you know a hundred years ago we probably would have ever seen and so it's mm -hmm. like well how do we how did this how do we incorporate these to our benefit whether it's a memory uh, device to to you know for whether it's a process or procedure or set of actions we need to do or or having it have other influences on us i think it's mm -hmm. it's super interesting yeah and i mean so one of the things I talk about when I talk about behavior change and work on those kinds of things is um, 
uh, kind of the cognitive systems that are play in decision making. And uh, Daniel Kahneman has systems one and two. And then uh, Jonathan Haidt has a metaphor about a rider and an elephant. So you've got the elephant, your big visceral, physical, sensory perception part of your brain and, you know, emotional. And then your rider is your little rational part of your brain sitting on top of the big elephant. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that system one and two, I can't even always remember which one's which. Like, and I've been dealing with this for, you know, the better part of a decade and stuff like that. Like, which one's one and which one's two? Because they're abstract things and they're arbitrarily assigned. You know, he means basically the same thing. One is your sort of automatic system and one is your kind of deliberate conscious system. Um, uh, But if I use rider and elephant, everybody remembers which one's which on those because they've got a really strong visual to associate with it. So I need to like create a mind picture of what the number one is doing and what the number two is doing in order to be able to actually remember the Kahneman systems. But but we like our world is full of like abstract stuff. You know, mm-hmm. we're learning compliance rules and we're learning, um, you know, procedures for things and whatever. And so having some but our visual memory is so uh, strong and it's such a powerful thing. And so being able to leverage that more and better in our instructional design, I think is all to the, is all to the good. I, I, uh, I had a very good, when my original publisher that they were willing to just let me go to straight to full color printing. And I didn't know at the time that this was a big deal, but it is actually a really big deal because it's not inexpensive from a printing cost, but the fact that I was able to use um, images, all sorts of images throughout the book. And a lot of those are the things that stick with people and, yeah. um, and really kind of make an impact. And so I'm very spoiled in that and, and really appreciate that I was able to, was able to do that much with the visuals in the book. Well, speaking of the book, I want to talk to you more about that, but before we do that, let's take a quick break and we'll be back in just a second. Hey everybody, I want to tell you about a resource that is available that is a fantastic one if you're not familiar with it. It's called the Video Viewer Study. It's a research study by TechSmith. It talks a lot about using video and why people watch videos and why people stop watching videos. It's got so much good information that you can apply right away. I want you to go and check it out. So we're going to put a bit.ly in the show notes and below. So if you're watching this or listening to this, you can go out and just download it. It's free, no charge to it. And you're going to learn things like why people stop watching videos. What are the most common reasons? How important really is good audio? We talk about it a lot here on the show, but really, what do viewers think about that? And so much more. The the link that we're going to point you to is also a blog post with an episode previously that done on the Visual Lounge with author Dr. Jane Bozarth, and she talks through the research, what it means, and some of the great things that you could be doing today to make your videos even better for learning or for whatever purpose you have. So go check it out. All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm here with Julie Dirksen. We are talking about all sorts of things, instructional design, and we're nerding out and it's super fun. So, so Julie, uh, you, you mentioned your book and I want to, I just want to make sure we're giving people a chance to understand. So tell us a little bit about, about your book, what it, what it is and what it's about kind of at the high level. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that I was realizing, I, when I was working on, uh, the ideas for the book, which is back in like the two thousands, give or take, um, uh, was that we sort of seem to not have a good first book in the field. Uh, and by that, I mean, if you want to learn about user experience, your first book is Steve Krug's Don't Make Me Think. And if mm-hmm. you want to learn about graphic design, your first book is maybe Robin Williams' Non-Designer's Design Book. There's a couple others that, that fit in that space too. But um, And I felt like we didn't have that sort of like first book that you hand people when they are getting started with instructional design that would give them some foundations and some guidance, but not, but be readable by kind of any audience and not be overwhelming in terms of the language or in terms of the jargon and things like that. Um, the Mager, Robert Mager books, the Mager six pack were, were good for that. Like they were very readable, um, but they were, you know, I don't know. I can't remember. I think those came out in like the sixties. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of, you know, and also they're a little expensive, but, um, but I, you know, what, and, and do you buy all six and all, all that kind of stuff? Um, uh, and they hadn't been updated and they're great books, but they, you know, they dated a little bit at that point. Um, and so, so that was sort of the goal was there's a whole bunch of people who, again, through like their own domain knowledge, um, which was sort of how I got into it too, are then asked to teach something to somebody else. And so they know all about their topic, but they don't necessarily know how to communicate it. And what happens is they would make it kind of look like the thing 
Okay, mm -hmm. so if I'm a trainer, I stand in front of the class and I lecture and I have a PowerPoint deck and maybe we have some discussion questions and then I write a quiz, you know? And like, there can be a good class that follows all of those things, but we've also sat through some really terrible classes <laughs> that have all of those elements. And so I wanted people to kind of understand a little bit more about kind of why you're doing certain things and when you're doing them. And so the goal was to give people that grounding or that underlying foundation so that they could kind of proceed with a little bit more confidence uh, and make better decisions around what they were going to include or what they were going to do or how they were going to structure things, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So as you as you kind of look out there, because I, I and I love that because I'm, I'm actually thinking uh, I have a sister in law. She she's moved into the world of training like she 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 didn't realize like really, this is what I do. Like I'm in this world and, and she's yeah. like, you know, trying to figure out how to be a trainer and do all this stuff. And I'm thinking, you know what, this book actually might be really good for her to, to, as she's moving into doing some more, more things beyond just the classroom training. But I'm curious for the people that you see that are just getting started, maybe they're, you know, they're getting your book and trying to figure out how to apply, or they're just coming up and talking to you. What are the things that you think trips people up the most at the beginning that like they should just be aware of? Because I mean, it's, it is, I think there's a kind of a real transition. If I'm a practitioner of something to this, it's, th there are definitely some areas where you could, you could make those mistakes. I, I like what you said yeah. about the classroom, right? Like I've seen, I've been in a classroom most of my life, like in terms of like going to school and I've seen lots of practices, but I don't necessarily really understand, you know, for a long time, I didn't understand how those came together to make good learning. So mm -hmm. what, what do you think yeah. trips people up? Uh, I think a big one is not creating enough practice. Um, I think that's probably the, the the biggest number one thing that that I see is kind of a weakness in a lot of the instructional design stuff is that there tends to be a lot of information delivery. Um, and that's usually not the problem is like getting content out there. The problem is giving people practice opportunities to apply that. And I struggle with this too when I do my own workshop design. You're like, I've got so much I need to cover. How much time? It takes so long to do practice activities, and mm -hmm. so sometimes you wind up shortchanging that a little bit more than than you should. Um, but that's a big one. Um, I also think typically the biggest advice, like if I if if I could only ask people to do kind of one, well, two things. There's two things. <laughs> if I could only <laughs> ask people to do two things, one is um, to uh, say so. For example a lot more like on every slide in your slide deck, make sure that you've got a so for example, cause that's, that's a thing that happens a lot. People who know a lot about this topic are picturing all sorts of examples in their head while they're saying, here's how, you know, here's how this engine works. Um, but they're not stopping and giving new learners examples of how to think about it. Um, and, you know, obviously for something like engine function, it should actually be an example with a visual associated with it or whatever. But even if it's like leadership training or something, and you're talking about giving feedback, you know, like, so for example, if you're giving feedback in this context, here's what you want to think about, or this context, here's what you want to think about. Because I think that that's a lot of stuff is starved of enough kind of case examples of different kinds of things. So I've been doing a technical edit on a book and I'm, I keep begging, I'm like, more examples, please, more, more. Yeah. Um, and so that's a big one. And then the other, the other thing that I usually, um, am sort of pleading with audiences to do is to test their solutions. And this is maybe a little bit more important when it comes to digital tools. Cause I think people who teach workshops get a lot of feedback about how stuff works, but if you're creating e-learning or you're creating any kind of digital resource, um, you know, test, test these out by watching people use it. Um, the aforementioned Steve Krug book, Don't Make Me Think, mm -hmm. explains how to do that very clearly. And uh, and so, yeah, user testing is a is a big, big, big thing that I advise people to do um, uh, for pretty much anything you create. Try, try it out. Make sure it works the way you think it's going to work, you know, and you can do it with a video. I mean, you can have people kind of talk through their reactions to it or anything like that. So. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting, the example one, um, because I, I can think like, I can viscerally think of things that like at times I've been like, I can't figure out what my, I can't wrap my head around it. Like I needed to see something or experience something or some kind of example. Cause it, that is really, 
it's really challenging. I think that is something I see as well. I'll, you know, we are, are, are blessed to go to a lot of different conferences and you hear these great presentations, but oftentimes it's like, well, now what? Or how did someone else really do that? And so uh, that gives me some good takeaways, the things to think about in my own kind of work of how to do that. Um, speaking of examples, actually, I, as I was going through the book, one, one of the examples fairly early on in the book, uh, within the first 20 pages, uh, was from research that tasks presented in an easier to read font. We're rated, oh, yeah. We're rated by persis- participants as easier to perform than those that are harder, you know, than like if it's curse up, it might be harder to read and harder mm-hmm. to perform. Um, so I, I'm going to make an assumption here and I, I don't know if it's right, but let's, we'll just kind of hypothesize here for a second. And you can, you could just shoot me down and say, no, Matt, that's not how it works at all. Um, but like when you look at something like that and you go beyond maybe a list of like one, two, three steps, Mm-hmm. In our courses and our learning modules, our presentations, um, does that hold up, do you think, in terms of like easy, clear, uh, you know, cur- plain font versus cursive font? Does that kind of yeah. carry through from a learning perspective? Yeah. Well, and so the specific, I'm pretty sure the specific example was like related to steps for doing an exercise or mm-hmm. something. And, and people were reading it in like, an aerial font, so really easy to read font, and then they read it in kind of a fancy script or something like that. And the people's perception who had read it in the harder to read font is that the actual activity was harder to do. Um, and that's an interesting one. And I honestly, I will tell you, I don't know if that one's held up or not. Um, there's been a lot of stuff since the book first came out where we're we're seeing a big replication crisis in the social sciences where mm-hmm. things like are an interesting phenomenon. And then when people try to replicate them, they're like, wait a minute. Um, so there's, uh, I, we're, let's like at least proceed with the assumption that that one still holds up. Sure. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but I will admit, I haven't gone back and looked at that particular body of research, which is like, flu- it has to do with fluency and stuff like that um, in a while. Uh, the, um, but there is definitely something to people's perception of difficulty. Um, which if nothing else goes to things like motivation. Do I think that this is a fairly easy, straightforward thing to do? Um, or do I think that this is a really difficult, complicated thing to do? Um, and that perception has an impact. So if people believe, so there's a there's stuff in the um, technology adoption space that says that people will adopt the technology if it's um, easy to use and useful. So mm-hmm. like I, should I keep this app? Well, it's super useful to me and it's super easy to use. Great. Um, okay. I can see why this app would be useful, but it's really a pain to use. Like I have to, it's constantly reloading and there's a bunch of things that are a hassle about it. Um, or, oh, it's easy to use, but it's not doing very much for me. Like, you know, these are, these are honestly just logical, you know, logical yeah. things, but just the idea that like, I need to think that this isn't that hard to do. And I need to think that this will be useful for me. And I think that those are very, that we should always consider when we're asking anybody to adopt a new behavior in a workplace or something like that is their perception that it's um you know going to be genuinely useful to them and they're very clear and can see tangible examples of how it will be useful to them um and use their perception that it's not going to be that hard to do or to implement like i've had stuff where i'm like I know that'll be good and i really should download it and i just don't have the mental bandwidth this week maybe next week you know, things like that. So, um, so it goes to, it goes to that. I mean, uh, on the flip side, sometimes from a learning point of view, that thing, if things are too kind of clear and easy, um, to understand, uh, we don't, we don't wrestle with the idea that much and it actually becomes a little bit less memorable. Um, Mm -hmm. there's some other research I cite later in the book that is, uh, Oh gosh, what is his name? He's the, uh, it was interesting because he's the guy who does the science videos on YouTube now, Veritasium. It's like a huge channel. He's got a gazillion followers. Um, and I was like, I was watching something where he's talking about his PhD research. And I'm like, wait, I know that research. I put that, <laughs> I have that in the book. Um, but he was looking at, he created videos around physics. Hmm. And he found that if he just explained the physics principle in a really clear way, people would be like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, versus if he structured the video around people's misperceptions of this physics principle and how they got it wrong and kind of wrestled through that and then came through and said, okay, here's how it really works. Um, the people 
rated the first set of videos that didn't have the misperceptions piece as being easier and clearer and easier to understand, but they also retained less mm. um, when he came back and tested them later, as opposed to the people who had been in the slightly confusing videos that had more um, information about all the misperceptions about that physics principle, but then kind of gave the right answer. They, they rated them less clear, but they actually remembered more of the information after the fact. So I, yeah, I'm not hundred percent sure what to do with that, but, um, uh, but I mean, you know, if, if the whole thing is to just facilitate, uh, like technology adoption or software training or something like that, you want, you want that clear, you want that easy mm -hmm. to understand. You want people to be able to get through it. If it's a bigger picture concept, you want people to really retain, or if it's something they're going to need to memorize and you can't you know, support it later through performance support or, you know, things like that, then you want to maybe make, figure out how to make it a little chewier for them so that they actually have to think about it more concretely because then it's a little bit more likely to be, to be retained. Yeah. It seems like you'd want to, like for that long term, you want, if it's easy, I just follow the steps. I can just go back to the steps anytime. But if, if I wanted that retention or really deeper understanding, uh, and I love, I love the the concept of that video because it sounds like, it, you know, it's not, it's not in, unclear on purpose either, right? It's not just confusing. It's right. using a, a methodology or, or approach that says like, hey, let's have you wrestle with these things. So we're not just giving you the answer one, two, three. So I think that's, that's a really interesting approach and very, but very purposeful, right? Like, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't want to stumble upon this. Like, hey, I made my video unclear. So guess what? I hope you understand it or. Right, right, more. right. Exactly. No, no. It's not the, it's not the lack of clarity that was helpful. It was the fact that they were, yeah, no, yeah. very definite strategy there. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there, there's so many other concepts in the book, in your book, and, I, and I'm, I'm curious about a lot of them. And I, you know, I'm thinking about kind of watching time here and thinking, you know, if, if there's, if someone gets your book and there's one thing you say, Hey, I, I think this is an, and most important concept, a chapter, where, where would you point us? Because I'm really curious because I think you need the whole thing. Obviously there's context there. It builds <laughs> yeah. upon ideas, but is there something you feel like from a takeaway that you think like, gosh, as an, I don't know for an industry, a profession, whatever you want to call us that maybe we're just still struggling with that. Like, Hey guys, we could generally across from as your, from your role as a consultant, as someone who's at industry events, <laughs> as a, a guild master, um, you know, what is that we need to get better at? Yeah, I, I do think maybe it's the practice design piece, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've already I've already done the I've already done the shout out for user testing, so I'll I'll go ahead and talk about kind of practice design. I think um, I've been I've been looking at other domains where I feel like the the structure of how they practice the skill is pretty well pretty well established. So like athletics, music, language learning are all domains where because the skill is so visible, we understand that you can't get good at it without practicing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, nobody's gonna play golf by reading a book and then going and playing, you know, nobody, you could try, um, but nobody's gonna be good at playing golf by reading a book and then going and playing golf. Um, uh, nobody, you know, nobody can like just watch the YouTube videos on how to play guitar and then be proficient at playing guitar, right? Like, I mean, you know, you need to be practicing with the videos or, mm -hmm. you know, trying it. Like you can, it's not that you can like watch all of them without ever touching a guitar and then pick up a guitar and use everything you've learned from those YouTube videos. Like you have to have that practice piece. You have to get, you know, hands on to things and stuff like that. And I feel like there's an interesting, I sometimes refer to it as the sports and things where you can kill people conundrum, where we understand <laughs> that. Like we understand it, we can kill people because we want pilots and doctors to practice before we turn them loose right. on the general population, right? Um, but uh, whenever it's not a life and death thing, we sort of just turn people loose. So like managers, right? Um, I, you know, like I think the requirement in, I live in Minnesota and the requirement here is like 60 hours before you can take your driver's test. Mm -hmm. And I'll often ask people, do you think, what's the less complicated task driving a car or being a good manager and everybody's like oh yeah being a manager is way more complicated than driving and in terms of proficiency in the world that's borne out right we have way more competent drivers than we have competent managers i think but um <laughs> uh, eh, probably not but you know what i mean um the um but anyway the the issue is is that there's all these cognitive things we just explain it to people and then assume that the explanation is going to be enough for them to go and do it 
we don't have a good feedback loop for it. How do I, how do I then let you try it and then have a feedback mechanism so you can find out if you're doing well with it or not and things like that. And that that's the biggest issue. So the chapter on skills development, I think talks to the practice design um, and there's probably a whole book on just practice design. <laughs> uh, Coming, coming to... soon in 2024, no, maybe. <laughs> no, no. The next book's going to be on behavior change, actually. That's, that's the one I'm going to write this winter. But so there will be, there will actually be a decade later will be a new book. But, um, so can, can I ask a question about practice design? Because mm -hmm. so and, and maybe this is Matt's perception of the world that I, I and I see this at conferences sometimes when people try to put in things. And I see this in corporate settings that there's often resistance to, like I think about I, 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 I was a people manager for a long time. I left kind of got out of people management doing some other things. And now I've been invited back and it's all the same company, right? Coming back now, have a small team. Uh, I went through some training that was provided uh but the thing that I found is there was resistance to practice training as a manager. And and this is not, I, I, I don't want to call it mm -hmm. the training or anything like that. I don't think that was bad. It's just, I think generally I get the sense that people feel that that is uncomfortable. It yeah. is maybe difficult. And so what, what thoughts do you have about, because like, it seems like, yeah, that's a really great thing until I tell people, Hey, we're going to role play or we're going to practice these yeah. hard skills. Like the only way I've gotten better at things like giving feedback is by giving feedback, right? Like mm -hmm. going through that process yeah. of, and having someone even there to tell me like, Hey, you know, maybe you could have done this or that. But, yeah. but I, I feel like that's a huge barrier to, to not, not all practice. Cause yeah. maybe it's playing guitar. If you mm -hmm. want to play guitar, it's probably fun to practice, but yeah. Uh, manager practice, maybe not so fun. Everybody, everybody hates role play. That's well, almost, almost everybody hates role play. Um, but you know, here's the thing about it: like, there we know it's super valuable, and we also know that people are like, eh, "Don't make me," you know. And a lot of it goes to: are there safe places to do it? I mean, that's mm -hmm. actually some of the interesting stuff that's coming up in the virtual reality space. Is like safer places to do role play stuff or something like that, where you not feel like, you know, nobody loves the the position of having all their coworkers watch them not get stuff right. Like mm -hmm. that is delightful, right? Um, uh, there, I don't have a great answer to that one. I think there are things you can do that create, um, that kind of step people into it. Um, so if you look at something like comedy sports or theater sports or whatever, like they will have these strategies where it's like, here the first time all you need to do is like, say the name of a color you know, and that's you speaking out loud. And then we're going to work up and work up until you're, you know, you're in a full blown like improv scenario or something like that, but kind of easing people into it so that by the time they get to the point where they're, um, you know, having to do the hard thing, we've, we've warmed them up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's a possibility, you know, like, honestly, this stuff is tough. This is why people who are good at facilitating that kind of thing and really kind of creating um, a safe and welcoming space for people to, you know, like fall on their faces a little bit and things like that. Um, that's a real skill. That's a, you know, a really concrete, a concrete thing um, that uh, some people are very, very good at and, you know, props to them. Um, again, I, I don't know that I have that one, but uh, the, you know, the challenge is, is it not fun? I mean, I, I'm really interested in video game design for this reason too, because video games, um, like, you know, 90% of what you do in a video game is practicing a skill until you, you can actually like kill the monster or whatever it is. Right. 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 Um, and you do these levels over and over and over again. So the question is what's a practice environment that th allows people to, you know, have that kind of adherence to it. So role play, obviously part of it is the, I don't want to look foolish even in front of my role play partner, much less everybody else. Um, but you know, like, can I practice by sorting like the good examples of feedback from the bad examples of feedback? Like that feels much safer because I'm not performing. I'm just making a judgment. Right. And can I find ways to kind of step people into it so that by the time you're actually in the full role play, they've had a, they've had enough time to warm up and they're at least a little bit over it. Yeah. Well, I want to, uh, a couple, just a couple more questions before we go to speed round. Uh, one, and 
I, I, I'm most he- hesitant to bring this up because I've, I'm guessing you get asked about this a lot, but I really appreciate it in the book, your approach towards what you said about learning styles. And let's oh, preface yeah. here, learning styles, not a thing, right? Like not, I, I got to keep telling people, right, but, right, but right. I loved what you said about like, okay, yeah, these aren't a thing, but the, the, it seemed like to me, and maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but like, um, there was still value in like thinking about different approaches and things like that. It seems like, so what would you say to people who are still in the learning styles camp today? Yeah. Um, learning styles feels concrete to people. And so I think that's part of the appeal. Like it's okay. This is a, this is, you know, one of the ways that you establish yourself as a professional is, you know, some stuff that other people who are not professionals don't know. And so we're always kind of hungry for that in instructional design. Cause a lot of these, things that we do feel like anybody could do them if they just applied themselves. And so mm-hmm. we like having some things that we can kind of, you know, hang on to that, that differentiate us. Right. Um, and Bloom's taxonomy, I feel like falls into that and some other stuff, but learning styles feels like, okay, I know about this. So therefore that's knowledge I have that other people don't have. And people get protective of it as a result. You know, the thing is even Daniel Willingham, who I think is arguably, um, the biggest debunker of learning styles or like one of the biggest debunkers of learning styles out there it acknowledges that there probably is something to it, but can we use it in a useful way when we're designing instruction? And the answer is no. Right. You know, there probably is some set of, whether it's preferences or, you know, but if you really wanted to know, does this person learn differently than this person? What you do is you put them into an environment where you're testing out different modalities and see if they perform differently. Like if this person leans towards modalities that have an audio component and this person does better with reading, like, but that's not how we, that's not how learning styles gets measured out in the world. (laughs) Learning styles gets measured by, you know, random little quiz inventories where you say, I like to study while listening to music. And then they decide you're an auditory learner. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, um, so the problem is we're, we're missing the steps, right? Mm-hmm. So it assumes that people are different, which I think actually is true. I think people are, have differences. Um, now the question is, do they have differences that are significant? And I think mostly they don't, right? Like everybody's a visual learner unless they've actually got a visual impairment of some kind. Everybody, you know, everybody does well if they can get their hands on some things and has have that odd you know that tactile sense for certain th- types of tasks mm-hmm. um you know than other things and stuff like that so it assumes we can people are different it assumes that we can measure those differences meaningfully and it assumes that if we know those differences that that should be reflected in the uh, kind of training that we design for different people and that different people may need different training and that first one may be true but the second and the third one don't have any basis that we can point to that says it's worth it. So it's not clear that we can measure it. Um, and even if we could, we're very, very clear that what's referred to as differentiated instruction, where I create a different path for my visual learners than my auditory learners, air quotes around mm-hmm. around those learner types, um, that it that it has value or that it pays off or it's worth the effort. And so... I don't, I didn't want to get into all of that. No, <laughs> no, no, no. But, it, but I, I think, I, but I like what you're saying, right? The, the, to me, it, it does. Cause look, I, I, I ardently go out there and tell people like I hear, cause I still hear it. And I try to say like, look, no, this is not a real a thing that you can use. Uh, but I like that you're, you're saying like, there's still value in understanding that, that having a, a multimodal approach to, to learning can benefit people. Right. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's not that because oh, if I were air quote a visual learner, I'm going to need visuals only, but like visuals, I might, that might help me. And it, but it's probably also going to help the person who, who says that they're, uh, you know, an auditory learner. So I, so yeah, I, I love right. that. Like when I was reading your book, I was like, oh my gosh, this makes sense. Like there's, there's value in thinking about like the modalities and value in thinking about like approaches, but ultimately learning styles doesn't hold up, but and, and as we create good learning content, thinking it, it's, it's probably a lot like saying, well, yeah, you also need to apply examples and practice and you need to have all these pieces together. So I, I appreciate yeah. you talking about it, though, because um, I know it's one of those things we just can't seem to, to quite, quite yeah. root it out. And I mean, you know, if somebody wants to charge you money for an inventory that purports to measure almost anything, that should set alarm bells up. 
<laughs> right. You know, <laughs> right. Um, uh, you know, those are always like, wait a minute, hang on. Let's just, let's just take a look, closer look at this. Um, you know, that kind of thing. But, but I mean, it, it is one of these things where I, I, I'm not a fan of the, like you said, learning styles, therefore, you know, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to berate you for, you know, right. Whatever, we, whatever. We like, can still be kind. We, we're still yeah, people. We're sure. still learning. I'm sure I have things that I understand that aren't maybe correct, or I learned a long time ago that have changed. I use that. There's that fake blooms tech, or not blooms, um, Dale's cone, the fake Dale's oh. cone thing, which is, we remember 10% of what we read mm-hmm. and 20% of what we hear and blah, 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 which is of course has no basis at all. But I, I got handed that in a, in an adult education class, um, probably 20 years ago now or something. And I used it. I was, I like showed it to clients and stuff. And then I was like, you know what? I don't know what the research basis of this is. And so I emailed the people that were credited with it. And they're like, nope, it's not ours. We've never heard of it. We don't know where it came from. (sighs) And I'm like, oh, that's bad. Okay. But I mean, like we all go through the process of learning about this stuff. So being unhappy with the people who are in the process of learning about this stuff seems to me to be, yeah, unkind. Yeah. For sure. Well, one more question before speed round. And I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about your own learning journey and where you're, you know, continuing to develop. Where do you turn to keep growing and improving your ability as a designer and as uh, someone who's thinking about learning? Because it seems like there's lots of sources. You are obviously will we'll put you in the advanced category. So how do you <laughs> uh, how do you keep growing and developing your own skills? Yeah, um, you know, uh, a lot of it is uh, having the conversations with people about these things. Um, The area that I've been interested in for probably a good 15 years uh, now is the behavioral sciences, because I do think that those absolutely apply um, to uh, everything that we're doing and that there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in that space that we can bring over. So, oh, I mean, if we want actual references, um, behavioralscientist.org is good. um, what else? Uh, yeah, um, there's, you know, there's a number of things. That's a, that one's a nice starting point, which really kind of looks at, um, uh, you know, behavioral, the behavioral sciences came up through a number of different fields. So there's a lot of stuff in public health or finance or safety or whatever it is. And then behavioral economics. And so there's a lot about like what helps people actually change their behaviors that I think is um, really relevant. And again, that's what the new book's going to be about this this winter. So hopefully that'll be helpful to people as well. And it's going to, the book's going to specifically look at, okay, how do we take this and apply it into um, learning and development environments and that kind of thing. Well, I, I, I love that. And, you know, I'm a fan of looking at, at research papers. It's, I find it's really hard to get research papers if you're not at a university though. Yeah. Like, they make it really tough, but it's, it's one of the things I actually, I enjoy doing that is just looking to see what, what are people looking at? And, and uh, it doesn't all yeah. apply. And sometimes it's like, okay, I, there's so many caveats with it because it's like, well, this very limited study on this very limited population. And it's like, okay, well, uh, it'd be a stretch yeah. to say it applies to everybody, but now, so I, right, I, right, I love right. that you're doing that. Yeah. And it, I mean, it is super hard to get stuff and it's in all, it's like basically I've got a small growling dog under the desk. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, in case there's a, an extra noise, but um, the, it's almost impossible to keep up. You know, there's just so much out there. So, um, yeah, you know, you do the best you can with it. Um, if people are interested in the learning myth stuff, Clark's book, Clark Quinn's book about, uh, goldfish millennials and other myths or something. I I have it. It's over there, but, um, but that's a great book that I do think everybody in the field should read because it just, it just goes boom, boom, boom through all of the different, um, uh, myths and fake ideas and misperceptions and all of those kinds of things uh, that are out there. And, you know, I mean, I don't want people to feel like they have to go out and read research papers um, because it's a lot, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, people shouldn't be scared of them. You know, you can read the abstract, you can read the methods and kind of understand what people are talking about. I know that they look frightening in terms of the academic language, but But, you know, like if you just kind of focus in on certain parts of it, you can actually go, oh, okay, that's what they're really saying. Because there's stuff out there like like Moravians. um, It's the one you've seen in lots of communication stuff where like 97 percent or some ridiculously high percent of meaning is communicated through tone and body language. And, you know, only three percent is communicated through the actual words, which if you think about it, 
is completely ridiculous. <laughs> you know, like yep. if that was true, you should be able to turn off the audio on a physics lecture and understand 97% of what this person's saying. Like, of course not. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like it comes from perfectly good research. And if you understand what the research is saying um, and how he conducted it, it makes complete sense, which is when the meaning of the word, the thing disagrees with the tone. So if I'm saying the word honey and I'm saying it in an affection tone, oh, honey, then you're, the meaning and the tone agree. But if I'm saying honey, <laughs> then which one do you believe? Right. And you're going to believe the tone, not the meaning of the word. So that's all his research says. But if you don't actually go and look at methods and stuff, you don't, you know, um, you don't know how to interpret this when it's summarized into a nice little pie chart and some, you know, presentation someplace. Yeah, that, that context really matters. Well, well, Julie, this has been, uh, I've enjoyed this thoroughly. Uh, I hope our audience loves as, as much as I do. If not, like I at least got this chance to geek out with you a little bit, but we're going to, we're going to go into our speed round questions. For those who don't remember our speed round questions are quick answers to quick questions, which we actually roll a die to determine. So let's jump right in. Okay, so uh, I've got two, so you can go with a green or a kind of a purplish pink dye. Does it matter to you, Julie? Oh, I don't know. I like both of those colors. Let's go purplish pink. Okay, so yeah. here's we got our dice cam, and let's see our first. Oh, it rolled right out of the dish. <laughs> that's that's never good. Okay, number. This is the first roll is a nine. So let's okay. come over to my question list here. Okay, this is this is a good one. Is there a question you wish I would have asked you? What should I ask you about that I haven't? Oh, uh, I think I got everything in. Um, uh, Cause even if you didn't ask that specific question, I still managed to uh, insert in most of my, most of my favorite things around like, Hey, do user testing, do more examples. Perfect. Have practice. So yeah. <laughs> and, and, I'm, good. and I'm glad you talked about those. So let's go back here. Let's do another one here. And this one is a four. Okay. Uh, you're getting all the, like the ones that are like perfectly aligned with an interview that are, <laughs> they're not super fun, but what's, uh, what's a top, like a tip or best practice not mentioned today that you'd want to share with, with the audience. So we talked a lot about user testing design. Gosh. Yeah. Mm, um, that's a good question. Uh, what else do I, what else would I put in there? Um, I go and follow people around. Like if you're not doing that with your end users, beforehand go and just hang out with them for the day um if you can uh you know sometimes you don't have the budget to do a big huge a big huge you know multi-week needs analysis but if you can just go follow them around for the day you learn all sorts of incredibly useful stuff and it's not that costly or difficult to arrange usually usually yeah you know it's interesting i was just at an event and i uh just invited some people i said hey i I'd love to talk to you. Just a quick interview, 15 minute. Like, can I ask you some questions? Super insightful just to say like, Hey, what do you think about this? What, what's your big problems right now? And that was super interesting. Well, let's do, let's do one more here. So let's go back to the dice cam. Here we go. 11. Okay. Uh, Again, you've getting out like all the perfectly aligned like questions that are, again, they're not the fun ones, but it's useful. So what's one resource you think everyone should know about? So, Oh, we were talking about this beforehand, but um, Kathy Sierra, let's, let's pick her because we were having yes. that conversation. So Kathy Sierra's got a book called Badass Creating Passionate Users or Creating... Oh, I, I, think, I think it's Creating Passionate it. Users. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And her blog, which is also called Creating Passionate Users, um, is still out there fully archived and loaded with fantastic stuff on the on the internet we can, i'm sure we can put the link in um but that book is uh fantastic and not enough people know about her these days um because she's kind of she there was trolling and bad stuff and she kind of pulled back from the industry um but she is easily the most influential person on my own kind of views on instructional design and things like all the visuals in the book and things like that are stuff that i absolutely learned from following her blog and seeing how she worked with, uh, you know, worked with images and all of those kinds of things. So I can, I, and I absolutely second, uh, that, that, uh, endorsement of Kathy, she had a big influence, her work on my early days at TechSmith creating content. So, uh, I, I love going back to her stuff and even, even still, 
uh, reference it a lot as kind of as we talk about how we approach our users and things that we should be doing. So what a what a great resource. Julie, we're going to have your final take in just a second. Before we do that, though, if anyone wanted to, to learn more, reach out, you know, work with you, how would they do that? Yeah. So the easiest place to find me is usablelearning.com, which is my uh, website and blog. Um, my, my blog, ever since Google Reader kind of killed, um, <laughs> uh, killed, you know, uh, the feeds, um, yeah. the RSS feeds. I, I don't blog that much anymore, but it may come back. We'll see. Um, uh, so that's the main kind of point of contact. I'm on Twitter, although I, not tweeting too, too much these days. Um, but the main place for interaction is if people are on Facebook, I have a Facebook group for design for how people learn, which is also the book title. And that's got about, it's got, we've got over like 6,000 people in there that are instructional design folks. And it's a great place to ask questions because I will answer them, but also a lot of other smart people jump in and answer questions there, which is fantastic. And, um, then I have a website called Design Better Learning where we're putting up uh, uh, instructional design courses. There's one up there now called Sticky Learning, which is about designing for engagement and retention. Um, and we're, I'm, fingers crossed, I'm going to have a couple more up before the end of the year. So Perfect. Well, everyone, go check out Julie's stuff. Go check out the, the sounds like the Facebook group is uh, next on my list of places to go. So <laughs> that's great. Uh, Julie, we like to wrap up the show with kind of your final take. So go ahead. What what would be your final take for us today? Yeah, I mean, I think I think operating as a professional, one of the best things you can do for yourself is making sure that you're getting enough feedback on your practice. I mean, it's a big thing that you can do for your learners, but it's also just a big thing that you can do for your own purposes. How are you finding out about the efficacy of what you're doing? And, you know, honestly, like I said, you can just go follow people around. You can go just talk to them, you know, a little bit afterwards. You can... Uh, watch them use stuff that you build. There's a whole slew of of quick quick methods for that that I think um, people aren't making enough use of, and as a result, we're all a little starved for feedback on 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 what we're doing. And uh, and you know, it can be a little uncomfortable, but ultimately, it's a really great thing. Awesome. Well, thank you, Julie Dirksen. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Thank you for all your great insights and information answers. Uh, I've super enjoyed it and appreciate you being here today. Yeah. Thank you for having me. You bet. All right, everybody go check out Julie Dirksen's book. If you haven't, if you haven't already, we'll look forward to her next book. Can't wait to get that. And then, you know, check out our Facebook group and those other resources. And if you have questions or things like that, you want to send my way about all the things we do here at the Visual Lounge, or, you know, I can always pass them off to Julie as well. You can email us at thevisuallounge at techsmith.com. And like we like to say at the end of every show, whatever you're doing and wherever you are, make sure you take a little time to level up. Thanks, everybody.